Hey, peace be upon you. Um, so we have Dr. Hassan Vidyan with us today. He's a professor at UC Berkeley. He's a professor at, he's a professor and co-founder at Zaytuna College as well. Um, his work is really important for advancing the movement and fairness uh, for African American and Latino students at Berkeley. And it's very important for those of us affected by issues of colonialism and Islamophobia. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> so good afternoon, assalamu alaikum. And thanks for the invitation to come and speak to you at UC Davis. So I'm gonna do two, possibly three things simultaneously, uh, speak about Palestine, uh, but make it in relation to Islamophobia and the business of demonization. And then third, to speak about the campus aspect of it and the demonization of uh, Palestinian students and those who are engaging on the work of Palestine. So those are the three threads uh, that you're gonna see uh, in my talk today. Uh, now, not that I like to see myself, but it seems that a lot of people uh, uh, like to take pictures of me, not because of the cameras, but because of the spy case. Uh, how a private Israeli uh, intelligence firm spied, sp spied on pro-Palestinian activists in the United States. This was a New Yorker uh, article uh, by Adam and Tuss uh, that documented the uh, intelligence operation that was directed at pro-Palestinian activists, in particular myself, and then also looking at uh, a number of canvases uh, with human intelligence. Uh, the indication from the documents that the New Yorker uh, have attained, uh, it seems that this operation was being uh, connected and directed by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs as a way to try to counter demonize and uh, target uh, pro-Palestine activists and PDS activists. Uh, and I think those who are engaged in the work of SJP or Palestine work in general uh, are aware of this type of demonization, uh, more so in relation to Canary Mission and the work that it's been uh, undertaking, which again, evidence shows or indicates that there are some connections in there. But this is not the first time that we see this type of demonization. Uh, I think the granddaddy of all the demonization, uh, I don't wanna say expert, but a demonization specialist is Stephen Emerson. Uh, who's early on uh, wrote American Jihad uh, that attempted to uh, demonize the Muslim presence in America. And for those who uh, are aware of the landscape, uh, know the type of work that Stephen Emerson uh, have done and continue to do in pushing Islamophobia, specifically uh, connecting anyone that does work on Palestine. Uh, so uh, in essence, that is uh, the work of Stephen Emerson. On college campuses, possibly, you'd also know David Horowitz, uh, uh, who's been connected to Front Page magazine, uh, also uh, the, the Islamofascism Week that was uh, uh, put on various college campuses, but also you see him in the book, The Professors, uh, to try to actually target uh, professors that are critical of Israel. Uh, so again, uh, this is a, a piece that you see it to demonize uh, the college campuses, to demonize those individuals on, on college campuses that are critical, not only of the US policy, but also Israel. So you lump them and you create almost a blacklist, uh, even though for me using the term blacklist is problematic, uh, we should call it whitelist, but again, we are in a different epistemic where blackness is often associated with uh, such endeavor. In order to understand Islamophobia in Palestine, uh, we have to go to Daniel Pipes. Uh, and Daniel Pipes, uh, in terms of his work, uh, is a very important work uh, in relations to pushing the demonization and uh, Islamophobic discourse. Now, this was a speech that he gave uh, on December, on October 21st, uh, 2001. He said, I worry very much from the Jewish point of view that the presence uh, and the increased stature and affluence 
and enfranchisement of American Muslims will present true dangers to American Jews. Uh, so again, if you just look at these operable words, uh, the presence, meaning you being here, is constituted as a threat. Uh, increased stature, that you're no longer on the margins of society, or that could be argued. Uh, affluence, that you have moved in certain sector from middle class to some possibly being uh, in upper middle class and some affluent individual. And more importantly, the, inf the enfranchisement, because the year 2000 Muslims actually voted for a block and began to engage politically. So he's seeing this as a danger. So you need to link the demonization, the attacks targeted at Muslims and also pro-Palestine activists to connect it to the discourse that uh, we are facing. Now, why Islamophobia? MJ Rosenberg, Rosenberg, who formerly worked for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, recently wrote that the right-wing Zionists opposing the community center in New York, he was talking about the Ground Zero Mosque in 2000, uh, 2010. He said, they believe that the more acceptance there is of Muslims here at home, the less reflexive hatred there will be for Muslims abroad. And that, in their view, reduces America's sympathy for Israel. So again, what Islamophobia or those who are pushing for Islamophobia, they want to produce reflexive hatred. And when that reflexive hatred is present, then when Israel actually attacks and demonizes and kills Palestinians, arrest them, demolish their homes, uh, have a few campaigns on Gaza, then that reflexive hatred will actually mitigate and reduces the ability of the American public to engage and critique Israel. So in essence, this is a strategic deployment of hate to produce uh, reflexive hatred. And in general, also to stoke Islamophobia and national security concerns to oppose the GOP in the midterm elections. So Islamophobia and demonizing Muslims, pro-Palestine activists, has also an impact on the elections. Now, this is nothing new in relations to Islamophobia. Uh, possibly one of the most ex expensive Islamophobic projects uh, was actually the uh, project that was uh, uh, produced the Obsession documentary at a cost of $17 million and distributed 28 million copies, DVDs, uh, two weeks prior to the, uh, uh, the election in 2008. Uh, so this was produced and funded by the Clarion Fund. And then the next one, the third jihad, which is up... Uh, uh, and the upper side of the uh, page. Now, do you notice whose eyes are there in uh, that documentary? Whose eyes behind, below the flag? Anyone? Go ahead. Obama. So why Obama's image is being identified with the third jihad. Okay, This one says radical Islam war against the West, the up one, the third jihad. You remember that Obama was being accused of being a closet Muslim. Right? And as such, it began to say the whole, the term taqiyya, all right, that Obama was a brotherhood plant in America. Uh, to conspire to take over America and have a creeping Sharia in the White House. And you have to say that if somebody believes in that conspiracy, I want to talk to the person who made that conspiracy. For somebody from Kenya to come to the U.S. as a foreign student, to locate a white woman, to impregnate her, then divorce her so he'd appear to be a Clark Kent away from home, right? And then for the child to grow up, uh, to fit into the American society, to make it to Harvard, to graduate as a lawyer, then go back to uh, uh, Chicago to work as a community activist, and then in a few years make it as a senator and into the White House. If that's an, a plan by the Brotherhood Movement, you need to talk to them. Maybe they could solve our homeless problem in this country. <laughs> but a large segment of the American public, again, uh, bit on that uh, framing, because of deep-seated and work on stalking Islamophobic discourse. Now, this was again was followed by framing again Obama as being the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood movement, and then also shaping him in this uh, type of uh, 
uh, representation. You could say he looks good in the outfit, right? He might show up on Eid in that way. Right? But it was strategic. I argue that people in the US wanted to use the N word on Obama, but they found comfort in using the M word on him as a signpost for the N word. So they stoked the Islamophobic discourse as being part of unease and discomfort with the first African-American making it uh, to the White House. Now you might ask, what is the connection to Israel? And in this, we have to think of Israel in uh, Cold War era and what is Israel's role in post-Cold War era. Israel's role during the Cold War, uh, it was a strategic ally, regional power in the Middle East, uh, uh, protect Western interests in the region, especially oil as well as uh, trade uh, infrastructure, uh, keep balance of power in the region, uh, provide valuable intelligence in the region as well as globally, uh, test and develop weapons. So that was Israel's role in, during the Cold War. But post-Cold War and the Iranian Revolution, uh, Israel recast itself uh, uh, it has its role uh, to counter and prevent Islamic extremism and Arab nationalism. So we could actually see the literature that Israel produces uh, that begins to shift from the PLO, from uh, targeting PLO organization to begin to use Islamic terminology and opposing what they call is they are the frontline state in opposing and uh, dealing with the rise of Islamic uh, uh, radicalism and uh, extremism. Uh, it asserts, reasserts its strategic value in a unipolar world because the United States was the only superpower. So now Israel has to assert itself why Israel is important versus other countries uh, to the United States. So it casts itself in that. Uh, then begin to speak of a common interest with the West, we. And that's also you have to roll into it the whole discourse of clash of civilization, of Huntington thesis. So again, Israel becomes really the go-to uh, in relations to that discourse, provide training and know-how as subcontractors. So it's not surprising that most of our police departments nationally go to Israel to train. And therefore, you actually become a subcontractor in a variety of areas, expand its foreign policy reach so as to become more viable to India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, etc., and then become the go-to experts in countering Islamic ideologies and uh, movement. So uh, again, you could see that footprint uh, uh, throughout. One of the most widely used books uh, post 9-11 is the uh, Rafael Patai's book, The Arab Mind. Uh, that becomes a must read uh, for many of those who are engaged in any type of strategic uh, thinking uh, and intelligence. I put intelligence between two parentheses because any book that says the, the mind of any group of people is actually the examination should be the persons who actually framing that their mind should be tested rather than the other way around. But again, this is the type of framing that we get uh, uh, in this notion. <clears throat> so who's producing Islamophobia in the United States? Uh, Pro-Israel activists have been the major contributors to the financing, uh, production, distribution, and use of Islamophobia in the American context, right? period. Uh, while other forces are present and do employ Islamophobia in the United States, nevertheless, the pro-Israel activists have set up the structural backbone of the Islamophobia operations in the United States, which is how to keep U.S. unconditional support for Israel in a unipolar world. And so again, the hub, the support, the financing, not only that, we just recently had uh, uh, evidence from tax return. These are 990, which is nonprofit organization. The Jewish federations in the United States, San Francisco Jewish Federation, the LA Jewish Federation, actually were funding Islamophobic organizations. Uh, they funded uh, uh, this person there, the one with the hair, uh, Gerd Wilder. If you don't know Gerd Wilder, Gerd Wilder leads a, uh, an a party in the Dutch parliament in the Netherlands. Uh, that's neo-Nazi uh, party. And the San Francisco Jewish Federation funded him. Right? They funded uh, Canary Mission. Uh, they funded David Horowitz uh, Center. So again, Jewish Federation does a lot of good work. But at the same time, they're funding the Islamophobia. And then they're coming saying, we need to actually counter Islamophobia together. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't fund Islamophobic organization and then come say, let's have a dialogue. A dialogue about what? 
Like what type of cake we're gonna be? Okay. So, look at the organizations that pro-Israel institutions behind Islamophobia. Every one of these organizations either is led by a major pro-Israel figure or is funded by a major institution within the American Jewish community. Again, this is all based on 990 return, tax returns of who is funding and who is actually providing the resources to the Islamophobia industry in the United States. For, again, the purpose is to maintain U.S. unconditional support for Israel. I think they're mistaken because on the one hand, they're stoking Islamophobia, which is bringing all these neo-Nazis, white supremacists out. And as we noticed with the attack in Pittsburgh and the attack in uh, San Diego, as well as other attacks around the country, white supremacists hate as much Muslims and Jews, their equal opportunity in relation to their hate. They hate everybody except themselves, right? So I would say that those within the Jewish community, the organized Jewish community that are funding Islamophobia and funding these hate groups in order to protect Israel are committing a grave mistake uh, in relation to protecting Israel while fanning the flames of white supremacist neo-Nazis in a hope that this will protect Israel because they have some type of distorted theology and political uh, point of view. Again, pro-Israel institutions behind Islamophobia, you could uh, go through the list, and each one of them is, again, uh, contributing uh, to the massive demonization of Muslims with a focus on the Palestinian dimension uh, in it. So if you go through their pages, their websites, you could see that often the demonization is taking place relative to Israel uh, and uh, Palestine uh, uh, perspective. We also get into Mercer and Cambridge Analytica. Now, how many of you know uh, Robert Mercer and Cambridge Analytica? We heard about it in relations to the election, right, 2016. Uh, and also uh, their engagement in the Brexit. So why would Robert Mercer engage in Cambridge Analytica as well as uh, engaging in the funding of uh, uh, the infrastructure that looked at how to impact the elections. Also, Robert Mercer in the 2016 election uh, sponsored the two most Islamophobic ads in the United States, which had on one uh, having the uh, France uh, being represented as being taken over by ISIS and then the uh, uh, the Eiffel Tower being covered with the ISIS flag and the Mona Lisa covered with a niqab, right? So that was one, and the other ad was replacing the Hollywood sign with a, uh, an ISIS uh, flag and therefore it's welcome to uh, the United States of ISIS. So those two ads at a cost of two and a half million dollars were Robert Mercer targeting specifically white uh, voters that have uneasiness about uh, Muslims and uh, communities of color. So again, Cambridge Analytica, Robert Mercer, uh, who uh, funded it and is the, uh, uh, really the financier and the uh, brain behind this operation, as well as uh, Breitbart, right? We, 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 thought, we think of Breitbart, we think of uh, uh, Stephen Bannon, but we don't actually go to step further why Robert Mercer is setting up Breitbart uh, with uh, his daughter Rebecca, uh, which essentially becomes the hub of demonization of Muslims and demonization and pushing white nationalism and white racism in relation to the discourse. So you have to make those connections to understand what is taking place. Not only that, also when Jewish leaders decide to harass college kids to support Israel, uh, and this is where you get the harassment that takes place, including harassment of progressive Jews who no longer are holding Israel as the center of their identity. And increasingly we have uh, uh, Jewish, uh, young Jewish uh, kids that are actually uh, having an alliance and solidarity with the Palestinians. I think the position of GVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now and others, uh, break the silence. All these are being targeted likewise by these campaigns. So it's actually, again, is targeting individuals that no longer are seeing Israel, support Israel right or wrong, but rather there's a shift 
uh, that takes place. So in 2015, the Jewish community's strategy shifted. Uh, leaders who fav favored aggressive confrontation, so we actually can point to a shift that took place uh, in the United States and in the strategy of how to actually uh, begin to harass these kids and a shift in a strategy because they felt that the PDS movement, uh, the, uh, the development on college campuses and other parts of the world are shifting and therefore what we need is to go aggressively against both Jewish uh, Americans and European Jews as well as Palestinian, pro-Palestinian activists and we need to engage in demonization and I would say intensified uh, the Islamophobic discourse uh, that took place. Uh, and again, an, out, uh, an online blacklist called Canary Mission, which went live in 2015, targeted college students critical of Israel, uh, professional pro-Israel operatives uh, posed online. As you also see some, if you watch the Al Jazeera uh, documentary, you could see the connection here locally. All these were operations that were well-funded and also connected to Israel Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Just to think that a, a, a ministry of a foreign country operating and connected to a local campus in order to actually demonize the students who have picked up the uh, cause that is connected uh, to that country. If it was any other country, you would see the chancellor and everyone else would actually uh, reject it and would speak against it. But in here, actually, the university joined uh, when they issued the, their own statement, all the 10 Chancellor issuing a statement against PDS. Uh, it's unthinkable for Chancellor to actually protect a foreign country, no matter what foreign country it is, protecting it against their, the best interests of uh, their own students. Uh, this had also consultants that were involved and uh, major Jewish donors contributed to this campaign. So this is again, essentially what we are saying. So this is my page in the Canary Mission. All right, so again, you're having uh, and individuals. Now, what I started with the story from uh, the New Yorker, the operation was two and a half million dollars to actually have an intelligence campaign, which also targeted my own street. So uh, one morning in September, I would get up and all the streets up and down, they had flyers of me and Rebecca uh, from J Jewish Voice for Peace calling us terrorists uh, into my neighborhood. So you go up and down, meaning it's an operation that actually uh, uh, have resources and is committed. And that same day, they also did the same for Rebecca who lives in New York. Uh, what is the coincidence that across from New York to Berkeley on the same time, these flyers dumped on the same streets, on her street and my street in this way. Again, this is the practice of or the uh, demonization. This operation comes out from the Root Institute report in 2010 of what needs to be done in order to counter uh, the rising and the success of the PDS movement. Uh, so you could actually see the report uh, then being given legs and begin to be implemented into a strategy in, in 2000, <coughs> 2015. So what we have is the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs that is active uh, in attempting to target and counter PDS uh, activists and PDS uh, uh, work. And Erdogan, uh, actually, who uh, made it clear in terms of his appointment uh, that the fighting PDS is one of his main goals because Israel identified PDS as the uh, existential threat that faces Israel, and therefore no, uh, nothing should be spared in targeting and going after anyone that supports uh, the PDS. Uh, and uh, the budget that was given is 25.7 million, but all indications that actually went up to 30 plus, uh, aside from domestic contribution here inside the United States that also funded Islamophobia on the one hand, as well as the anti-PDS campaign. There was a Las Vegas summit uh, 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 that had both uh, Sheldon Adelson uh, and Haim Saban. Now, Sheldon Adelson is one of the major funder of the Republican uh, political PACs, while Haim Saban is a major funder for the Democratic uh, side of the political spectrum. This is not to problematize, quote, any Jewish contribution to the political process. Jews, like any other group in the United States, have the right to engage in the political process. But 
in here, uh, both Sheldon Adelson and Hayim Saban were targeting, again, a protection of Israel, uh, rather than thinking of what is the best interest of the Jewish American community. And therefore, on the one hand, partnering with Trump, uh, who has been spouting racist, as well as giving a nod and a, and a wink to the white supremacists and white nationalists, yet there is no critique as long as he delivers uh, on uh, some of his promises, whether it's to move the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, uh, the annexation of the Golan Heights, and all the other elements, including what is called uh, the deal of uh, the century. So the uh, Las Vegas summit, again, uh, brought all these uh, funders and all these groups in order to actually strategize uh, in terms of how to deal with the PDS movement. Now let me say the following. The success of the PDS movement is directly connected to, I would say, to Israeli policies. Israel uh, uh, attacks on Gaza that was witnessed by people globally is the direct out or the direct result or the direct stimuli for the success of the PDS movement. Right? It's not actually the opposite. It's Israel's decision and in insistence in to use maximum violence against the Palestinians at a time where it no longer has the ability to control messaging because messaging now is much far more easier on social media and so on. So Israel was unable to control the messages and therefore that is the direct result and the direct outcome of what took place. Second, uh, the fact that the United States is engaged in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan opened a large number of questions and issues and Israel is among one, one of those questions. There is no, nothing left uh, to be taboo, and Israel no longer is a taboo subject of discussion, uh, whether before the 2016 election, and I think for sure post-2016 election. The assumption in Israel is uh, there is some type of a conspiracy that is taking place that is resulting in the success of the PDS. But again, their idea of conspiracy is there's some type of a, a Muslim convergence that is occurring between Muslims uh, communities in the West and the left, and therefore using the label of anti-Semitism is a way not to engage in the debate and the discussion. Nothing is taboo in the United States, and I think President Trump even uh, hastened that discussion because nothing is left that could be seen to be left in the closet. All right, again, these are the direct consequences of the period that uh, we are in. All right. So, Canvas Pro-Israel Group monitored progressive Jewish students, so not only uh, Palestinians or Muslims. Uh, and the breaking of the silence about this, uh, inside the Israel Rights Campaign to silence an anti-occupation group, so also focusing and targeting pro uh, uh, individuals that are working and exposing Israeli uh, oppression. So for individuals that want to see the, the, the private Mossad, which is the site group, uh, the whole report is available at the New Yorker. It gives us in detail what their strategy uh, is. Now they set up a private group specifically to bypass uh, US law and restrictions. US law prohibits foreign intelligence services to operate in the United States. If a foreign intelligence uh, operative comes, they have to register. Uh, with the United States as an agent of a foreign country, most embassies have intelligence attaches, the, they register and no on. So this group is supposedly retired Mossad agents that set up a private uh, company, but they're coordinating with the Israeli uh, Ministry of uh, Strategic Affairs. So all indications these were uh, Mossad uh, agents that were acting as a private front, something that also the CIA does overseas. They set up a company and operate as such. So you could see from their campaign and their strategy of what was done, they actually conducted a human uh, surveillance uh, uh, in relation to individuals. I do believe that my own classes at Berkeley were subject to the surveillance uh, by this group, in addition to, again, my home and neighborhood uh, as well. So the engagement of this group was uh, something that we could actually document with uh, primary documents coming uh, from them, targeting three campuses, eight individuals uh, in the first run, and then uh, later on uh, uh, 
to roll it into a massive campaign. In some cases, the Psy Group operatives conducted on the ground co covert human intelligence <coughs> operations against their target. Israeli intelligence officials insist that they do not spy on Americans, a claim that is disputed by the US, by their US counterparts. Israeli officials said, however, that this prohibition does not apply to private companies, such as Psy Group, which use discharge Israeli Defense Force Forces soldiers and former members of elite intelligence units, rather than active duty members in operations targeting Americans. Uh, so uh, this is actually something that uh, to be aware of. I believe that a similar campaign is now being unleashed on Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, because the same type of footprint that we are seeing that was targeting myself and so on, and others in the PDS is now have similar type of dynamics relative to Ilhan Omar. It is not what you call uh, uh, produced by grassroots or individuals that are sitting in cafe after they drink a latte, all of a sudden say, I hate Ilhan Omar, and I would have put a, a tweet about it. These are strategically engaged that are developed with a particular targeting and a whole systematic process. And what we need is that we know that the psych group, the FBI, became aware of it, and they had to shut operations. The question, what other private groups that are there operating uh, with co coordinations, both with the Israeli St Ministry of Strategic Affairs, as well as some major uh, pro-Israel groups domestically. Now, the FBI actually investigated, uh, or my theory is that the FBI began to get on their trail as they were investigating the Russian probe in relations to the elections and most likely came across him and they ended up actually shutting down the operation. So that's again some of the footprint uh, that you are actually uh, seeing relative to the intelligence. So now I'm gonna shift to the university. The assumption that our universities are neutral is only an assumption that does not actually meet scrutiny. Now I don't know how many of you uh, saw this. Uh, this is our 10 UC chancellors signing, signing a letter and a statement against PDS that was published across all of the campus and we received it all by uh, email. So does the university chancellor have the authority or the uh, status to actually issue a statement against a tactic that is used by uh, whether a student group or any movement uh, in the United States. It's a nonviolent uh, uh, boycott group. Uh, so in essence, the university chancellors are taking a position against boycott, divestment and sanctions, something that, as we know from the Texas case, uh, is uh, uh, constitutional. You have the constitutional right to actually engage in PDS. I also had my case against the state of Arizona Likewise, the court have determined that we have the right to boycott and the Kansas uh, as well courts. So the chancellor issuing this statement, meaning that they are deciding to line up with the position of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel. Now, individually, you could have your own position, whether chancellor so-and-so have his position, I oppose the PDS movement they have, but now they're putting the... Uh, uh, the latter head of the university, they're speaking from their office on behalf of a foreign country, right? That this is the status. Now we already have some movement from various council across the UC system that are opposing uh, what the uh, chancellors have done. Uh, because again, the assumption that that university is in neutral is, in this case is not. And I would say evidence shows that the university has not been neutral when it comes to Palestine, I argue that the university often acts as if it's a desk in the State Department. Uh, and they take the role that we need to actually have a new peace negotiations between Palestinians or pro-Palestinian students and pro-Israel students. That's not the role of the university, right? The, the role of the university, again, is to provide equal access to people and free speech and academic freedom to engage in inquiry. It is not the role of the university to try to drag Palestinians, pro-Palestinian students and pro-Israel students and try to get them halal kosher uh, uh, gathering in order for them to reach a peace deal uh, uh, at any campus. But the university takes that role because it's been uh, uh, often engaged politically with that uh, dynamics. Now, 
we get immediately to uh, the case that took place at UC Berkeley. Uh, at UC Berkeley, we have something called decal courses, uh, which is something that the students have gained during the struggle in the 1960s uh, to actually have a democratically uh, developed course by the students with the guidance of a professor uh, to try to actually address gaps in the curriculum. Uh, do we have ethnic studies in here? Do you have African American studies, black studies, Latino studies, Native American studies? All this field started as a decal courses at Berkeley. Right? Before you had actually a black studies uh, department, you actually had students that set up uh, a decal course uh, because the curriculum did not reflect uh, their history, their narrative. Uh, they were completely absented. So similarly, a student uh, of mine uh, uh, said, I want to start a course uh, under decal. And uh, this course, again, is uh, Palestine, a decolonial uh, analysis, or uh, framing it in a decolonial analysis in ethnic studies. So we went ahead. Uh, the course, usually to propose a course, you propose it the semester before. Uh, you get the paperwork. The paperwork gets to be to the department chair. Department chair signs on it. Then it goes to the academic senate. The academic senate looks at it. Sometimes they kick it back, say, you know, add this reading. There might be another reading, so on. Kicks it back. The academic senate votes on it, committee on courses, and then gets a number. Without a number, you can't do anything, as you know, right? <laughs> Right? You need a number, a course control number, in order to add your course, and then it appears on your transcript. So the student actually did all this uh, process uh, in order for uh, the course to be approved. Uh, now, the university uh, decides to suspend the course in the second week of the classes, meaning the classes already started. We say that the caravan already have left, and the students are enrolled, and the class is there. Now what we get is actually uh, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, carries a whole campaign with others against this course. Now uh, Paul Hawaida, who was actually uh, uh, the student, uh, really, he said, released a public statement saying, he said at the time, he learned of the course was under scrutiny from a report in the Israeli media that described the involvement of an Israeli government minister uh, in efforts to cancel the course. So let me say that Paul, before he knew at Canvas that something was afoot about the course, his family in Palestine told him that the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel and a minister said that this course will not, be, will not happen. Right? A minister in Israel, not in D.C., saying this. And he said, two hours later, I received an email from the university Notifying of the suspension. Actually, the university used suspension, but they used cancel. The class is canceled. That's the, the language that I uh, used. I was off campus at the day, right? And uh, the university sends me an email and Paul, as well as the chair of ethnic studies, that if you could come back to meeting, it was actually Eid day. So I was off campus and I received the email. I said, like, I'm able to come back. I'll come back at 3 o'clock. So this is what I say administrative checkpoints on college campuses. That the administration, just like you have checkpoints in the West Bank, the administration actually have checkpoints in relations to uh, Palestine. I don't know what type of checkpoints you have went through to organize this Israel Apartheid Week. Right? I know the checkpoints. I know what type of administrative oversight you had to go, what type of... I have organized everything under the sun. But the administrative checkpoints that the university puts when everything that has Palestine on it, it's a different level of scrutiny at all. You could stand in any, any campus and say, the United States has no right to exist. Nobody bothers you. Maybe the dean will come and actually clap for you. Right? But if you stand there and you say Palestine, now it's just a completely different scrutiny. Not like the SWAT team has to come in. Right? Again, that's administrative checkpoints that are there as a direct result. And I assu my assumption today, and I said to the students who organized, most likely the university already have received 15 complaints. They received a com complaint from every major of the Zionist organization. When a complaint comes, the university takes it as a marching order. So they begin to scrutinize actually 
much more and begins to actually brings you into uh, this type of uh, review. Now look at the groups that actually uh, put together this uh, uh, complaint. The first one, Academic Council for Israel. Academic Council for Israel. Again, what is, a, what is a council or a group that is in a foreign country complaining to a university, UC Berkeley, in relation to a course taught by a student matriculating in its, in its, uh, in its university and supervised by a faculty member, right? Uh, and then you have the list of groups and organization is who's who uh, in the major organization. Now, when I went to the meet with the dean, the dean took the, this is the poster advertising the course, fall 2016, DECAL, Palestine, a settler colonial analysis. The dean said, this does not mean our academic uh, requirement because it does not mention Israel. She did not even bother to actually read the, the actual poster because if you look at the second and third map, it just it says Israel or Israeli right there. She did not even read yet the poster that she had on her desk because she was actually giving us the statement from the letter of complaint from outside as a dean, that's not your role, right? And your role is not to actually, they received the letter 6 a.m. or they are approximately, by 10 a.m. the class was canceled. Just in terms of, you receive a letter of complaint and by 10 o'clock, class is canceled, and I receive my, uh, the email from the dean at 11 o'clock asking for a meeting. Right? You get, tell me what type of response that the university actually uh, uh, will take. So Paul said that, the university said the following. Paul uh, Hadwe did not comply with policies and pr procedures that govern the normal academic review and approval of proposed courses uh, proposed courses for the DECAL program. For student-led courses, said Dan Mogolov, the, the school's assistant vice chancellor. So basically they said that the student, Paul, did not actually adhere to policy. This has been doctoring afterward. UC Berkeley reinstated student course on Palestine. After we went out of her, the meeting, and I asked her, is this meeting, uh, do you see yourself stepping back? and working back to actually reinstate the course, she said it will be almost impossible to do so. So we went out and actually began to organize uh, because the administration has no right to cancel a course. The academic senate and the faculty has the ownership of the courses and uh, the curriculum. The university has only su supervisory role of contracts, making sure that the classroom is clean, that the technology works, all this, that's their role as administrator. They cannot, they don't have the responsibility to do so. So we went back first to the uh, department, the paperwork was correct. Went back to the academic senate, the academic senate was completely taken out of surprise. How do you cancel a course without actually asking us because the university administrator, the dean, the chancellor, if they want to cancel a course, they should ask, send a letter to the uh, committee on courses and the uh, chair of the academic senate. They say, we have a problem with this course, right? And again, there are many, there are problems that occur in courses, but you cannot cancel a course without investigation first or without review, right? And sometimes they actually send us somebody to be observant in the course, like, uh, some of the courses, but none of that. So the curriculum of course, the committee on courses likewise complained and said this is not uh, gonna happen. The only other time in the history of UC Berkeley that the university canceled courses was during the US bombing of Cambodia, where the university was in upheaval, so the university asked the academic senate to cancel the courses uh, toward the end and give the students the grade that they have. That's the only time in the history of UC Berkeley, right? So again, uh, they still blamed uh, Paul, right, for what took place, but they had to reinstate the course. And then they said that uh, course was reinstated after solving procedural issues. Revisions were made to the syllabus, completely wrong. There was no 
change that was made to syllabus. The only, there's one word change that took place, which instead of analysis, uh, 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 the course was renamed Palestine, a settler colonial inquiry to, uh, from uh, settler colonial inquiry to settler colonial analysis. That's the only change that took place just in the naming or the title, and that's it. I refused to sign the paperwork. They sent me the paperwork to actually re-sign a new paperwork. I said, no, if the academic senate has approved it and the department have signed the paperwork, I will not. I could only write a letter to say that I stand by the course description and what I uh, signed uh, back in May of the last, the previous uh, semester, and I will not sign a new paper because uh, signing the new paper indicates that actually the, the procedure was wrong. There was no, nothing wrong with the procedure. It was the university, so I refused to sign a new paperwork. I say I'll stand, and I checked with the academic senate, and the committee, of course, say your signature from the previous still stand, and the course is approved as is. So there was no change in the syllabus, nothing whatsoever, but the university, again, continued to make a spin that they were actually overseeing, and the wrong or the mistake was actually, uh, uh, the student was wrong. Uh, then the dean had to, was forced to adhere to policy because she violated policy by canceling course. She said, I fully support and defend the principles and policies of our campus that protect the academic freedom of all, uh, all members of our community, whether students, faculty, staff, or visitors, as well as uh, shared governance of our campus by the administration and faculty. So this is the dean's letter. But we still demanded an apology for Paul. Because Paul, uh, Paul was actually thrown under the bus by the university. He said, I await an apology from Chancellor Dirks and Dean Hesse, uh, explained why the university threw me under the bus and publicly blamed me without ever even contacting me. It seems that because I am Palestinian, studying Palestine, I'm guilty until proven innocent. To defend the course, we had to mobilize an international outcry of scholars and students to stand up for academic freedom. This should never have happened, okay? So we actually pursued it, and the dean had to issue an apology to Paul, okay? So again, the university, complaints to the university result in the university acting to actually censor and limit the academic freedom, the free speech, uh, rights of pro-Palestinian activists, pro-Palestinian -Palest uh, academics, students, scholars, and so on. So you need to be aware that this is the dynamic that you're operating, the assumption that the university is in neutral or that you're engaging in a, an environment uh, that allow and nurture you is not something that you actually, the university have evidence. This also add to the dimension on the whole notion of Islamophobia. I truly believe that the university have not yet begun to address Islamophobia. They are very good at putting a hijab woman on their advertisement and flyers. There's a like, sometimes actually the, the, the women that they put, for me this was majorly insulting because I teach Islamophobia. They actually put a face of a woman that is a foreign student, uh, for a, a visiting scholar, not even a student, on an advertisement and a promotion for admission. Right? It's just like, how can, how can you actually begin to untangle uh, this process? So they begin to substitute PR rather than addressing real systematic aspects relative to Islamophobia, marginalization of Muslims. Uh, constantly, if you look at all of the literature and the material that we are often, Muslims are only engaged either as a terrorist or as an apologetic discourse. There's nothing a full spectrum of it. In most of our courses, literally time and time again, all what you read is the problematics about Islam and Muslims. Muslims are exceptionalized even in academic discourse, and the university is part and parcel. So you need to also connect, and I think yeah, part of that problem comes into the intersectionality between Islamophobia, Palestine, and the demonization process that you're demonized, so you're never actually allowed to speak for yourself uh, on an equal footing. So in essence, you're, uh, I tend to argue, we are a citizen on probation, uh, meaning that your citizenship is unequal, and you don't enjoy the same protection. You might be able to have the formative citizenship, yes, you have right to vote and so on, but in all other consideration, your citizenship is emptied of the meaning and values, right? And the university often participate uh, in that process, and what you need is to challenge it. So I'm gonna stop in here and take your questions. Uh, uh, 
and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Thank you. Yes. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanction is a successful movement overall. Uh, the strategy was to, again, to begin at the college campuses level, at the student level, and I think for the most part that has been successful. Uh, now it's beginning to look at uh, areas of unions, especially on college campuses, unions, and then uh, union councils outside in order to bring in uh, those into, uh, into the fight and into the struggle for PDS. Uh, then the next level will be to begin to have a localized dimension of policy making. And I think in some countries that's far ahead than the United States because the United States again is one of the most difficult terrain uh, because of the long history and entanglement and the strength of our opposition, in particular APAC and all the different groups that work with it. Uh, so in that sense, you have to look at it from a different, from a longer historical lens. Uh, will we be able to reach a level where everybody is gonna engage in boycott? Uh, uh, maybe some products, but not all the products. Uh, so we have to be strategic, even during the anti-apartheid movement where uh, I was part of the committee here in California as well as the National Student of Color uh, Coalition. I was the chair of it. We targeted Coca-Cola as the major uh, brand for us to rally the anti-apartheid movement on college campuses because Coca-Cola was in South Africa. Uh, Pepsi was not in there. And we were successful in making Coca-Cola a major problem and a challenge on college campuses, including here at UC Davis. And we won when Pepsi began to put its uh, proposal having a clause of social responsibility and saying we're not in South Africa. That's for me when Pepsi began to actually adopt our language in the, PD, in the uh, PDS movement for South Africa. And I think those are elements that we're gonna see happen uh, with us uh, as we continue to do the work that is needed. Boycott is one dimension, divestment in another dimension, and sanctions in another dimension. But overall, I would say that the genie is out the bottle in relation to uh, uh, the PDS movement. And I know Canvas Watch have written an article that I said the genie, meaning that this is something you know, uh, dangerous. Again, uh, their uh, skill in metaphorical language is challenged. I recommend for them a class in metaphors. But again, uh, they've never been a good students. But that's my own reflection on it. Any other? Um, so a couple of quarters ago, I took a class in Pop Warner Radio. And the class itself, it could have been worse. It wasn't that great. But the book was horrible. It was by a real figure that was called Simply Warner Radio. Yeah. So it was just propaganda. And it was really bad. And I had asked the professor. I had brought it up to him. And I had and I found out that he was sent by the Israeli government to teach the course. Yes. He had to apply to his book. But he, had, he, he himself had written the book, but he had to apply to it. Does women really know anything about this? Well, uh, part of what you call responding to BDS, there's been an increased effort of uh, uh, strengthening Israel, uh, US college campuses relations. Uh, it took many forms. For example, you have the inclusion of Israeli studies that are taking place. Uh, or bringing and increasing the number of exchange scholars coming to teach. And in particular, uh, not areas outside, but all the subjects relative to Palestine. You can't have a Palestine course uh, without having really the uh, faculty or the individuals that are dealing with it often being uh, reflective of the pro-Israel or being Israeli themselves, with few exceptions. I don't want to generalize. I think you have a program in Columbia University, the Palestine Studies Program. You have uh, maybe Brown University with uh, um, uh, faculty in there, so there's exceptions. But at UC Berkeley, again, the courses on, even the courses that are registered regular courses, political science and so on, are often Israeli scholars that come as a visiting scholars and they become 
really the avenue uh, by which not only the books, but actually the person himself, and that's reflective of broadly of what takes place on college campus, and I think that's one of the challenges. The other thing is the study abroad program. There's been an attempt to strengthen those study abroad program uh, while simultaneously fighting against allowing Palestinian universities to have a study ab abroad program for those who have not followed the case of Rabab Abdel Hadi in San Francisco State University. She's been demonized and attacked because she developed a relationship that the university approved with the Najah University. So now the pro-Israel infrastructure have been attacking her and now she have a lawsuit against the university. So I recommend people to actually, on the one hand, strengthening and increasing uh, study abroad program on your college campus while almost tormenting anyone that does anything similar with Palestinian uh, universities. Now I think we here on campus, we need to challenge these study abroad program because it's not equal. If you're a Palestinian, most likely you're gonna be returned from uh, uh, from the border in Israel, so it's no, there's no equal access. Aside from the problematic that you have a state now that officially is not, does not belong to all its citizens, an official apartheid state by its own declaration, where the prime minister running says that Israel is not a state of all its citizens, it's a state of the Jewish people and it alone, meaning that it actually belongs to one segment of the society, 22 to 25 percent of the, of the Israeli citizens who are Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims, are not equal citizens. That's the exact definition of an apartheid state. And aside from the West Bank, we could talk about the West Bank, the Golan Heights, the Gaza, even if you take those, as Israel as itself, as a state, does not belong to its citizens. So the notion that uh, you will get what you call the uh, Zionist spokesperson, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Yes, it's a democracy for the few at the expense of the many in relation to the Palestinians. Same way South Africa was a democracy under apartheid, and also during Jim Crow and before, the United States was a democracy. If you were white and property owner, you, it was a democracy. Women could not vote, black could not vote, Native American could not vote. So this, again, the language that they use in order is a silencing act. The only democracy in the world, and therefore you should not actually engage in further and uh, begin to point at the contradictions that are deeply embedded in there. Any additional questions? Once, twice. Uh, well, on the one hand, I don't want to give them the pleasure to think that their strategy has succeeded. I think the pro-Palestine work has become far more uh, uh, assertive. Uh, I think the fact that uh, both Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib in Congress have burst the bubble uh, on PDS. Uh, uh, Ocasio just yesterday, she actually raised the question of cutting U.S. aid to Israel. So the main pillars of what you call the un unspoken words relative to what you can and can not say in relations to Israel has already opened up. And I think that debate is increasing. Is there an impact on the students? Yes, there is. And I think some students have been targeted and targeted systematically. And what we need is to actually tar speak to the university because the university is role is to protect the free speech of the students even though if they disagree with the speech. So the university has been culpable because they did not actually issue a statement. They issued a statement against the PDS. So far till today, they have not issued a statement against the Canary Mission. They have not issued a statement against Canvas Wash. They have not issued a statement, you know, when uh, David Horowitz put my, po my, my face, Rabab Abdel Hadi's face, Judith Butler's face, and put all posters all over the campus, the university did not name who was responsible for it. This is saying, oh, some people put posters. MashaAllah, people put posters for everything. Right? So you need to challenge them and constantly challenge the university. I don't want you to, take it to, to speak in allegorical terms. I want you to be very specific. So you need to take it to the university. It's their role to protect you. If the university could protect what you call the uh, white supremacists coming on speaking on campus and they name exactly what happened, they should actually name those who are targeting Muslims and Palestinians and pro-Palestinians in issues that are fundamentally human rights issues. So the, the impact is there, but I think the university has been, it's not a neutral actually, is aiding and abetting by its silence. Silence is not a choice.
Any questions? No? Okay, I'm going to just do a plug for something. Might as well, right? It's We just uh, released uh, a new report. Uh, this is Islamophobia in India, Stoking Bigotry. I run the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project and Islamophobia Studies Center. Uh, so this is the first ever report on Islamophobia in India. Uh, so if you, it's available to download uh, at uh, IRD, irdpproject.org, it's free. Uh, and you should actually uh, look at it. It's, it's a, uh, Islamophobia in India is actually uh, very, very problematic. I would say China is currently the worst, Myanmar, and then India. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, you have circumstances that uh, are stoking Islamophobia uh, with all kinds of uh, violent attacks against Muslims, the so-called love jihad, uh, beef, uh, uh, lynchings that takes place because somebody is accused of eating beef and then the whole lynching mob descends upon them. Uh, so definitions of key terms. Uh, so this is the first ever on Islamophobia in India. Uh, so I encourage people to download it and access it and begin to use it in their work. So. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Thank you all.